In 1967, American movies changed forever with the release of Bonnie and Clyde, Arthur Penn's heightened telling of Depression-era robbers Clyde Barrow and Bonnie Parker. It was violent, it was funny, it was sexy and frank about sex. It seemed to glorify criminals while being frank about the coldness of crimes. It had a European flavour that the old Hollywood establishment didn't understand, but audiences, and eventually critics, flocked to it. Once the floodgates were open, American movies became more daring, controversial, and artistic, ushering in the greatest of all movie decades, the 1970s. The film also worked as a vehicle for its two magnetic stars, Warren Beatty, who also produced The Risky Venture, and Faye Dunaway. It went on to earn 10 Oscar nominations, including Best Picture, and won two, not to mention gather a large profit off its relatively small budget. But the real story of Bonnie and Clyde was anything but glamorous or romantic. It was a dirty, desperate handful of years filled with callous robbery, murdered lawmen, and bloodthirsty career criminals. Bonnie and Clyde quickly went from folk heroes to despised pariahs, thanks to their unrepentant crime spree in the Midwest and South. And a true telling of their exploits would likely repel viewers rather than engage them. Screenwriters Robert Benton and David Newman would go on to say, We had decided early on that, for dramatic purposes, certain figures of considerable importance had to be eliminated, certain adventures altered, certain facts ignored, and certain characters combined from many into one for the sake of simplification. And they weren't kidding, because the movie and the reality are more than just a few feet apart, and we're going to delve into the whys and hows to find out just what the f*** really happened to Bonnie and Clyde. Hey, what's your name anyhow? Clyde Barra. Hi, I'm Bonnie Parker. I'm pleased to meet you. Let's start at the beginning of this doomed love affair. In the film, Bonnie and Clyde are depicted as meeting in a charming manner, as Bonnie spies Clyde contemplating stealing her mother's car. They proceed to walk into town and talk, and both actors are so charismatic, and their pad is so adorable. You going to work, huh? Yeah. What kind of work you do? None of your business. That you don't for a second doubt that the two characters are falling in love. In reality, Bonnie and Clyde met in a much more ordinary way, through a mutual friend. While not much is known about the actual circumstances of the meeting, it definitely did not involve Clyde looking to steal a stranger's car. One factoid that does not come up ever in the film is that Bonnie was actually married at the time she met Clyde, to a man who eventually went to prison. Supposedly, they never legally divorced, and Bonnie apparently went on wearing her wedding ring even after getting mixed up with Barrow. The duo were a bit younger than their big screen counterparts. Clyde was 21 at the time, while Bonnie was 19. Beatty was 29 during the film's production, while Dunaway was 25. And while, of course, movies always make the principals a lot more attractive than the people they're depicting, the real Bonnie and Clyde were pretty far from movie stars. Both were short and thin, with Clyde supposedly no taller than 5 foot 6 inches, more than a tad shorter than Beatty standing 6 foot 2 inches, with his golden boy good looks. One of the brief topics of conversation during that initial meet cute is a curious moment where Clyde admits that I chopped two toes off that foot with an axe. What? Why? To get off a work detail, you won't see it. Talk about getting off on the right foot. This is a mixture of fact and fiction. Barrow did indeed chop off two of his toes with the help of another inmate to get out of work detail, but this happened after he'd met Bonnie. Something the film doesn't depict is that Clyde was arrested and sent to prison sometime after he and Bonnie met. And in a desperate attempt to get out of working, he resorted to spiting his own foot. Ironically, right before the incident, Barrow's mother had successfully petitioned the governor to grant Clyde an early release, making the self-mutilation quite unnecessary. In fact, prison was a big part of Clyde's life, and he was arrested several times and sent away for long stretches, where he was reportedly brutalised by guards and fellow prisoners. One motivating factor for the career criminal was his hatred for authority and the prison system in particular, leading him to often plan to break out inmates. Supposedly, towards the end of his life, Barrow aimed to get as many guns and gang members as he could, so he could attack the prison where he was sent when he was a teenager, kill the guards, and let all the prisoners escape. None of this is touched on in the movie, and we never see Clyde nor his best girl behind bars, even though they've both spent time locked up in between crime sprees. Bonnie even once slipped him a gun inside the prison walls. The depiction of the Barrow gang is quite different in the film than it was in real life. In Penn's film, the Bonnie and Clyde gang solely consists of five members, the two headliners, Clyde's brother Buck, who also has a bad history with the law, Buck's wife Blanche, and a shy, unassuming kid named C.W. Moss, played by Michael J. Pollard, who Bonnie and Clyde decide to take under their wing one day. In reality, the gang consisted of many different members throughout the years. Some prisoners Clyde helped break out of jail being chief among them. C.W. Moss never actually existed, and is actually an amalgam of a few of the real gang members, mostly a small-time teenage crook named W.D. Jones, whom Clyde had known for years, and another career criminal named Henry Methvin, who had escaped prison during one of Barrow's raids. 
Methvin ended up being the undoing for Bonnie and Clyde, but we'll get back to that in a little bit. W.D. Jones would later say the movie depicted Clyde all wrong, that the movie's portrayal of him as a braggart was inaccurate because the real Barrow was sly, cool under pressure, and kept his mouth shut. Jones did cop to the C.W. Moss character being somewhat like him, quote, a dumb kid who ran errands and did whatever Clyde told him to. But Jones also said Clyde always drove the cars, while his job was relegated to fixing them whenever they inevitably broke down, and of course stealing them. One aspect of Bonnie and Clyde's courtship that fascinates in the film is their sexual relationship, or lack thereof. Quite early on, Clyde makes it clear he's not necessarily interested in Bonnie as a sexual creature, claiming he's no lover boy and so it goes that he's depicted as either uninterested or unable to be with her intimately. This was a falsehood created by the screenwriters Beatty and Penn, who thought the dynamic between the two characters needed something extra to increase the dramatic tension. Don't you ever just want to be alone with me? Well, I always feel like we're alone. In fact, initially Clyde was written as bisexual, who invited C.W. Moss into a threesome with he and Bonnie, but this idea was discarded. There's no evidence to suggest that Bonnie and Clyde had the problems their movie counterparts do, at least when it comes to matters between the sheets. The film depicts the Barrow Gang as lovable crooks, if admittedly a tad destructive. Yes, they end up killing a few cops, but that's usually when their backs are against the wall. The one civilian we see killed is a bank manager who Clyde impulsively shoots in the face after a robbery, and afterward the movie depicts him as having remorse for the murder. In reality, these folks were anything but lovable losers on the run. They're estimated to have killed at least nine police officers and a handful of civilians during their years-long spree. One man was killed in cold blood after he tried to stop Clyde from stealing his car. W.D. Jones did write later on that Clyde didn't actually want to kill anyone, but he would do so without hesitation when he had to. He hated the idea of going back to prison so much he'd do anything to get out of it. It's a myth that Bonnie and Clyde were famous bank robbers because in fact they mostly avoided banks, instead focusing on grocery stores, gas stations and other small businesses. When they started to gain some popularity in the media, they were being depicted as modern day Robin Hoods of sorts, at least at first, since this was during the Great Depression and no one had any love for the banks. For the average person, Bonnie and Clyde looked brave, perhaps even enviable, thanks to how they stuck it to the rich fat cats. But the truth was, they were robbing everyday working folks, taking what they wanted whenever they wanted. The public began to sour on them as the tales of their exploits got nastier, especially when they killed policemen in cold blood. None of this can be found in the movie. One of the film's more memorable sequences contains a very amusing cameo from Gene Wilder as one half of a nervous kidnapped couple. Oh, oh but he just loves Texas now, huh? don't you, Eugene? Those are that cow. <laughs> While this exact scenario didn't necessarily happen, Bonnie and Clyde were often known to kidnap people, along with their cars, only to dump them off somewhere a little while later. Sometimes they'd even leave their victims with a bit of money to help them out. These stories no doubt helped solidify the initial positive impression they received from the public before the grislier facts started to come out. Another memorable scene in the film has the gang kidnapping a policeman and taking pictures with him, humiliating him in the process and finally letting him go via a rickety old boat. That policeman later makes it his business to catch up with the gang and take them out no matter what. The gang did like taking pictures, and there is indeed a famous one of Bonnie with cigar in mouth and gun in hand, but they'd never taken any with the policeman. In fact, the pictures were their ultimate undoing, as after fleeing a shootout with the cops, they inadvertently left undeveloped film behind. The police developed the pics and slapped images of the robbers in as many papers as possible, alerting the public to these crooks. The heat would get so bad on Bonnie and Clyde that sometimes Clyde would wear a wig when they were in town to avoid being sighted. Meanwhile, Bonnie was constantly dyeing her hair different colours, even doing the same for W.D. Jones. We don't see any of that in the film. The cop that the couple takes a picture with in the film was meant to be Frank Hamer, now a famous lawman who was more recently played by Kevin Costner in Netflix's The Highwayman. Hamer never had the occasion to bump into Bonnie and Clyde until he was called to, being hired by the Texas prison administrator to hunt down the gang after they helped kill two guards during an escape attempt. Hamer was a well-respected Texas ranger in the law enforcement world, and his depiction of the film so unsettled his family that they sued Warner Brothers for defamation of character. The case was settled out of court, and we'll get back to Mr. Hamer in a moment. Despite the hard times they endure in the film, Bonnie and Clyde continue looking as pristine as ever, their movie star's good looks never wavering. A frightening incident in real life that made Bonnie anything but glamorous was not included in the film. One day the gang was driving when Clyde accidentally crashed the car, which flipped over in a ditch. Bonnie was caught inside the car when it caught on fire, and acid from the car's battery sprayed all over her right leg, literally melting her skin away. W.D. Jones would later write they didn't think she would live, and he could see bones peering out in certain places. 
places. They of course couldn't go to a doctor or hospital, so they had to tend to it as best they could in the shadows. Bonnie never recovered from this injury, having to limp everywhere she went, sometimes even having to be carried by Clyde from place to place. Suffice it to say, it's understandable why they didn't include this grisly event in the film. Speaking of grisly events, a momentous occasion for the gang is when Clyde's brother Buck, played by Gene Hackman, is shot in the head, while Buck's wife Blanche, played by Estelle Parsons, who would go on to win an Oscar for the performance, lose a sight in her eyes during a confrontation with the police. This was somewhat accurate in terms of what went down in July of 1933, though certain facts were altered for dramatic effect. No surprise with this movie. In both reality and movie, the police descend on a cab and the gang is renting in the middle of the night and a shootout ensues. Buck is shot in the head but survives, while Blanche's eyes are damaged by shattered glass from a policeman's bullet. The gang kills a couple of cops before the melee is over. In the film, the cops track the gang to a field the very next morning and commence shooting at them, hitting Buck in the back and killing him and arresting Blanche as the others get away. In reality, the gang hold up at an abandoned amusement park for a few days while Buck miraculously remained alive despite a hole in his head. Locals had noticed a suspicious characters camping out and soon police and civilians alike were surrounding the gang who once again took on some gunfire. Buck was shot in the back several times but still managed to survive, only dying a few days later in hospital. That's one resilient fella you've got to admit. Blanche was arrested and given 10 years in prison and it's interesting to note the real woman evidently hated Parsons' notoriously shrill performance, which is indeed unflattering. Finally, we get to the most infamous sequence of the film, its bloody conclusion. This happened months after Buck's death, though in the movie only a few days have passed. In the film, C.W. takes Bonnie and Clyde to his father's home so they can convalesce and avoid the law. C.W.'s father is outwardly impressed with his son's new friends, but in actuality he hates them and what they've done to his son a tattoo on his chest in particular, and plans on alerting the police to their presence. As mentioned earlier, CW, and by extension his father, didn't exist, but this did slightly follow the facts of what happened when Bonnie and Clyde's aforementioned cohort, Henry Methvin, who they helped break out of prison, planned to meet them at his parents' place in case they ever got separated. Legend goes the police, led by that famous Texas lawman Frank Hamer, persuaded Methvin's father to stall his car in the middle of the road to slow down Bonnie and Clyde, just as CW's more willing father does the same in the movie. In the film, Clyde stops the car gets out to attend Moss's car when the police open fire upon he and Bonnie, but in reality the cops didn't even wait for the car to come to a full stop before plugging it with dozens of bullets. Barrow was allegedly struck in the head almost immediately, dying before the subsequent gunfire could do their part of the damage. A statement from the cops would later claim they fired upon Bonnie and Clyde with rifles, shotguns and pistols, emptying all the weapons and expending about 130 bullets total as the car kept rolling. The cops kept blasting the car even after it stopped and it was clear the criminals were no longer part of the living world. Clyde Barrow's corpse had 16 bullets in it, while Bonnie Parker's had 26. Supposedly, The Undertaker had trouble embalming the bodies because there were so many holes in them. While the movie doesn't show this ugly detail, it surely depicts the deaths of the two people as brutally and unflinchingly as any movie had up until that point. It was a landmark scene in cinema and still packs a punch. While Arthur Penn's movie may have romanticised its protagonist, that uncompromising ending did not shy away from the classic trope, crime doesn't pay. And though audiences may have left the theatre feeling a little bad for the lovers on the run, Hopefully the knowledge that, in reality, they were closer to calculating criminals than happy-go-lucky troublemakers, and that eased the barrage of bullets just a little bit. 